Hello scholars, this is the professor speaking, and I welcome you to Hi, That's Scary, a podcast that utilizes cannabis to analyze horror cinema. The title of today's lecture is Remakes and the Role They Play, Part 3. Today we will be continuing our discussion on My Bloody Valentine 3D. If you have not listened to Remakes and the Role They Play, Part 1, and Remakes and the Role They Play, Part 2, please pause and do so before you continue. Last lecture, we finished on Megan and Sarah being attacked by the miner in the grocery store, with Megan having been caught and killed. Sarah is sitting in an ambulance getting treated for her arm cut by an EMT. She questions Axel as to why Megan was a target, and then speculates that it was a way to get to him. When he questions her, she says to him, I'm not blind. The tea is spicy. Sarah knows math. She's not stupid. She knows Axel's a cheat, which probably made her extra salty about Axel's accusations, and she deserves to be. Deputy Martin looks at Axel, and you can tell he's suspicious. Jumping to Axel and Sarah's house, we've got a car out front. I've never quite understood the car out front thing. I guess to maintain a separation so that the people being guarded don't feel it as much. But having a car in front with one person doesn't cover all the entrances and exits to the house. So is the point to have them nearby in case shit goes down? Then why not have them in the house where it would be faster to stop an attack? I bring this up because, like in every horror movie when a police car is out front, it didn't help. The miner sneaks into the house, murders the nanny. Two side notes. Her name was Rosa, and I think you can guess her ethnicity, so we got some racial stereotyping right there. And Axel is a small town sheriff, and Sarah is a grocery manager in a dying mining town. How the fuck do they afford a whole ass nanny? Then again, if we throw in the racial stereotyping, she was probably underpaid. Well, I hope they can still afford a nanny after this, because their previous one is dead now. The miner even goes after their son. Burke arrives out front and wakes up the officer in the car, who is sleeping instead of being awake and guarding the house. You know, her job. She, the officer, goes inside while Burke is still checking the perimeter. She's cautious and turns off the TV. Outside, Burke positions himself at a side entrance, expecting the miner to leave through there. Back inside, the officer makes a gruesome discovery. It's Rosa, dead, and shoved in the dryer because she was killed while doing laundry. The officer screams, and Burke hears it. He turns and is greeted with a pickaxe being spiked up through the mouth, as in his chin, neck, area where all that pickaxe is hidden in his flesh, the bit of tongue he has left, definitely tasted it. The miner then rips his fucking jaw off, and I can forgive any type of 3D effect, which wasn't terrible, but it's a night scene, because holy shit. Scholars, do you know how much that would suck? Technically, that probably didn't kill him immediately. So he suffered through the pickaxe in his chin, which don't just tickle, to then have his jaw yanked off his face. Here's hoping he passed out immediately from shock before dying from the blood loss, because if he didn't, he was probably in some of the worst pain imaginable for at least several seconds. We switch to Tom pulling over in an alleyway and calling Sarah. Axel isn't around when he does. He convinces her to leave and go with him somewhere. Axel gets back to see Sarah is gone, and right at that moment gets a phone call about a background check he'd put in for Tom. Sarah and Tom, meanwhile, are driving down a stretch of road. Tom tries telling Sarah that he thinks Axel is the killer. Sarah gets a phone call, and Tom 
tells her not to answer. She does anyway. Good for her. Don't take orders from him. It's Axel, who tries to convince her to get away from Tom. He tells her that Tom was in a mental institution for seven years, that Rosa and Burke are dead, their son nearly killed as well. Axel also takes this moment to apologize. He tells Sarah that she can leave him and he won't stop her, just get out of the car. This is the moment I actually believed that Axel loved Sarah. I still don't believe it's romantic love, but it's love. He's genuinely terrified that she's in danger. Sarah plays off the phone call as if she's talking to her mother about her son rather than to Axel and hangs up. Sarah wants to go home, using her son as an excuse. Tom says he knows that she wasn't talking to her mom and refuses. He tells her that Axel is trying to manipulate her and though she repeats her request, he still says no, which is kidnapping. I want to make note that this isn't a manipulation thing from Tom's perspective because he genuinely believes the killer is Axel. Sarah doesn't like his answer, understandable, and grabs the wheel, causing the car to crash. They hit a tree for a not good 3D effect. It goes through the car and looks like it's made of plastic. It's bad. Sarah gets out the car and runs. It turns out they're near the mines, because of course they are. Tom has to crawl out of the car onto the ground, screaming as he does so. Sarah, in the woods, you know, the woods the kids could have partied in instead of the mines and we probably could have avoided all this, yes I'm still mad and confused about it, calls Axel. He tells her to go to his fuck cabin. Yes, I am serious. Sarah reaches her destination and barricades the front door. She finds the valentine Megan had given Axel, confirming what she already knew, but that doesn't make it hurt any less, and it's visible on her face. She also finds the picture of her and Tom, the one Axel had used in their argument the other day, in a valentine's box. She looks around the fuck cabin a bit, and ends up finding a stash of valentine's boxes overflowing out of a cabinet. Sarah is now very much thinking that Axel could actually be the killer. Turns out there's a door in the kitchen, and there the miner stands. Sarah says Axel's name, and a pickaxe is swung. Sarah jumps out the window to get away and runs. She sent herself through a glass window and dips with fairly minimal pausing. It's impressive. The miner gives chase. Sarah runs into the mines. Before going inside, she grabs a flashlight and some kind of heavy, possibly battery thing? I'm not quite sure. She makes her way deep into the tunnels and hides when she hears the sounds of someone else. She turns off her flashlight. Waiting to hear the figure come closer, she jumps out and strikes. It's Axel, who drops his gun. Sarah picks it up and she's on guard. She insists Axel is the killer. He protests. Of course he would, but that's what the killer would do. Sarah tells him that she found the Valentine's boxes at his fuck cabin. Axel is confused for a moment before telling her that Tom is the killer and he planted the boxes. Sarah doesn't believe him. Axel then says the realest shit he said this entire movie. I've been working the past 72 hours. When would I have had time to play Psycho? And you know what? That's fair. A bit ableist, but fair. I know I've shot on Axel's police work in every part of these lectures, and I'm not done doing so. But Axel was actually working for days. I can acknowledge he was trying. This is the point where Tom appears. He points out the fact that Axel is the sheriff and can do what he wants, so that doesn't necessarily mean he was working. That's fair, that's a good point. It's wrong, but it's a good point. <laughs> they both try approaching her. She makes both of them stay back, holding them up. 
Axel tries to get Sarah to shoot Tom, and Tom tells Axel that they'd get him help. Axel brings up Tom's hospital stay, and he doesn't deny it. Axel is over at this point and says to shoot them both. Tom urges Sarah not to shoot anyone, and Axel repeats to shoot them both. Axel is coming at this from a law enforcement perspective. Sacrificing the life of an innocent, even if that life is his own, as long as the big bad goes down, is fine. Tom is coming at this from a vantage point of understanding mental illness. He truly thinks Axel has whole murdered people and tried to kill and frame him. He still does not want Sarah to shoot Axel. He doesn't want Axel dead. He wants him better. Scholars, that realization, that shit hurted. Even with what comes next, especially with what comes next, that shit hurted. Tom, not wanting anyone to get shot and prove Axel is the killer, points out that the words on the valentine from Megan were the same words written above her body. Sarah immediately is suspicious. She asks Tom how he knew about Megan and the bloody words. Tom says that she told him, and she knows that she didn't. Now, the whole thing that's going on with Tom is a vague form of DID, right? Well... Disassociative Identity Disorder was formerly referred to as Multiple Personality Disorder, but that term has been retired because it actually isn't a good descriptor for what's going on. I want to note that I did not study psychiatry, and the info I'm giving is based on what I have read in DSM-5 along with having watched United States of Terra, which is about the disorder, and worked with experts to accurately portray it. DID will usually manifest as a result of trauma. It's the mind's way of coping, compartmentalizing information to protect itself from re-traumatization. Think of it like this. Everyone has a laptop. After starting up a laptop, the next step is signing in, right? Click on the profile, put in a password, good to go. People with DID have more profiles on their laptop. They are distinct, separate profiles existing in the same space. Now. Picture being on the main profile, and while doing whatever, a virus is detected. It might infect the laptop. The main profile doesn't have the necessary software to handle the virus, but one, or possibly multiple, of the other profiles do. That profile will take over the system in response to the virus alert. It's automatic. When a person with DID encounters something triggering, another profile, generally referred to as alters, will take over to protect the host. The reason I'm going into this long-winded explanation of disassociative identity disorder, there's multiple, but the one I'm focusing on right now, is to be able to properly convey the statement that having Tom know what was written above Megan when the warden altar was present does not make sense. I can't make it make sense. The whole point of disassociative identity disorder is for the brain to compartmentalize info into separate alters so that it can function because trauma has made it so that the primary, Tom in this case, needs help in processing certain things. It would completely defeat the purpose of DID for Tom to know that info. Alters don't have automatic transfer of info. It needs to be exchanged. The whole point is to protect the mind. It makes absolutely no sense for this information, traumatic information, to be available to Tom. Tom didn't know Warden was him. He's not conscious of this alter, so him being the primary wouldn't have known to get the information in the first place. To go even further into things that don't make sense, Tom then starts seeing Warden comes toward them. He's terrified and begging Sarah to shoot Warden. But Warden isn't there. They do a thing where Warden walks up to Tom, stares at him, and slowly disappears. Like he was absorbed back into Tom. I don't think I need to explain how DID and schizophrenia are two completely different things, but I'm going to do it anyway. Schizophrenia is seeing and hearing experiencing something that is not happening in physical reality. 
DID is like being the something. The elders are real, they exist, but not outside of the body. These are two totally separate things. So, once again, this cool dissolve thing they were going for doesn't make a lick of sense. That's not how those mental illnesses work. I'm issuing a demerit, writing them up, they're getting a referral because this is bullshit. Mental illness stereotyping is stereotyping and I'm so tired. We get treated to some flashbacks of Warden in the Tom meat suit doing the killing thing. We get shown his transition from Tom to Warden, how he locked himself in the cage earlier, digging up Warden's remains, him ripping off the miner's mask after each kill. Now, during this, Tom was just brokenly muttering to himself. He's still scared, and his brain is trying desperately to process this information. It's still Tom. This laptop is hot, and the motherboard is at risk of frying. It's still Tom. So what does Axel, a trained law enforcement personnel, do? It's still Tom. So Axel drops the laptop in a bathtub. He decides, because he's him, which means fucking trash, to taunt the warden Alter. He's nasty and just dripping with contempt. It's disgusting, honestly. Yes, Tom has killed people. Yes, that is bad. Yes, Axel has a right to be angry. Axel does not have the right to fucking try and bully an alter, let alone one that he knows damn well is utterly fucking dangerous. He and Sarah are not safe from harm. Just because Sarah got a gun on him don't mean shit. Axel's taunts completely brings out Warden, and Tom is tucked away. Axel then tries to go at Tom with a pickaxe. No, even though he's the Warden Alter, I'm going to keep calling him Tom, because while Tom Tom isn't coming back and Warden's piloting the meat suit for the rest of this, it's Tom's face that's shown and not a miner's mask. Tom ends up getting the upper hand in the struggle with Axel, taking control of the pickaxe. Axel is able to grab a shovel. He hits Tom with the shovel, and in turn, Tom drives the pickaxe into Axel's gut. Sarah fires at Tom. He runs. Sarah helps Axel to his feet and helps drag him to get away. He doesn't look good. The sound of light bulbs breaking start to fill the tunnel. Sarah and Axel hide behind a corner. They check the gun and see it only has one bullet, because of course it does. So Sarah's got one shot, or they're dead. She waits until Tom is close, standing in front of some fuel tanks. She holds him up, and Tom lowers his weapon. Sarah hesitates. What if Tom is coming back through? He's not. Tom goes to swing, and Sarah fires. A 3D bullet pierces clean through Tom's side, hitting the fuel tank and causing it to go boom. Post-explosion, Tom is hidden among the rubble and slowly freeing himself. A search and rescue team is combing the mines and one of them finds him. Tom kills him. Axel is carried out of the mine on a stretcher with Sarah following. When asked, Axel says Tom is dead. Womp womp, that's not true, and he obviously didn't get the confirmation to make that statement. As he's about to be loaded into the ambulance, he and Sarah share an I love you. It looks like it's meant to be taken romantically, and I just... Scholars. Sarah, he cheated on you, and you keep having to save his ass. Ten years apart in both incidents, she saved him. Like, I need her to divorce him. While Axel is getting loaded in, a slightly limping search and rescue person in a mask leaves the mine, walking right past the cops. Tom takes off the miner's mask, looking a bit deranged before staring into the camera. Tom walks, limps, away, and the credits roll. It's time for our conclusion, scholars, and here's mine. Sarah, Axel, and Tom are all a part of this trinity of brokenness. By that I mean the breaking of the spirit, the heart, and the mind. Axel is the broken spirit. He finds out his mistress is pregnant for her to shortly after be brutally murdered, and thus his future child murdered as well. 
On top of that, his wife still knows about the affair. It doesn't matter that Megan is dead. It happened, and Sarah knows. His relationship with his wife became so bad that she was able to be convinced he was a murderer. He's constantly making things worse and ultimately fails at his job to protect the people that live in that town. He botched his whole life, and in doing so wears himself down, chipping away at the bits of soul he has left. Sarah is the broken heart. She has to go through her boyfriend, leaving out of nowhere after a horrifically traumatizing event. She marries Axel after they lean on each other to cope, and he ends up cheating on her. Tom returns, and a light flickers in her head of what could be. Then Tom turns out to be a killer. Not just a killer, but one that almost got her son. Over and over and over in this film, Sarah's feelings get cast aside and stomped on. It's clear how it wears on her. She grows to look so tired as time passes. And there's nothing she can do to stop it. Tom is the broken mind. The viewer gets to watch Tom's trauma and how that trauma impacted him. How that trauma ended up causing so much damage that his mind had to create a way to cope with it. How that coping mechanism ends up leading Tom into the darkness with the warden altar taking over. How in the end, warden is the one that escapes while Tom is still stuck in the cracked prison in his own head. This is the power of a remake. The performance by the actors greatly made up for how stiffly they were written. It makes it so that things like this, this broken trio concept, can happen. A remake can allow for a totally different perspective on a source material. It forces the viewer to pay attention to the small details because they are what make up the best differences between an original film and a remake. These differences can be so unintentionally in depth. A remake can foster unlimited potentials of new perspectives. With the power of a remake also comes responsibility. A responsibility to do justice to the story and its characters. While I believe the performances were great, the characters themselves were not. There's some glaring issues with the characters that can't be ignored. Sarah is allowing herself to stay in a loveless marriage that's only connected by trauma. Axel is a bad cop with a temper that always wants to be right. Tom is a walking stereotype for the mentally ill. The way this film handles these things is atrocious. Sarah needs to be in therapy and getting a divorce. Axel should be fired. Tom is made the villain because he killed people, and yes, killing people is wrong, but his mental illness is what the writers decided made him this way. That's a problem. Betraying the mentally ill, especially those with disassociative identity disorder, as these uncontrollable, dangerous people, has a real-life impact. Films like this reinforce the stigma around these disorders. People don't get the treatment they need because of that stigma. People die because of that stigma. Even before it's revealed that Tom is the killer, the film tries to paint him as evil simply because he spent several years in a mental hospital. Fun fact, being in treatment doesn't make you evil. With this, the film actually begins to unravel, because the minute Axel says that Tom was in an institution for seven years, my immediate thought was, then why was he allowed to go there alone? Why was he allowed to go back home alone? If Tom had been in a hospital for seven years, and we don't actually know when during the decade he was gone he went into treatment, why wasn't he still being monitored? People don't get out of these institutions after so many years without being monitored. Where was his therapist, his doctors, who allowed Tom to go back to that place that caused him so much trauma by himself? Tom is mentally ill. He would be legally not guilty by reason of insanity. He can't and shouldn't be held accountable, not fully aside from putting him back in the hospital. The doctors that failed him, though, they should be held accountable. Their fumble cost people their lives. These were the choices this remake made, and they're so fucking yikes that I can barely comprehend it. I can't focus on anything but how they turned Tom, who's just sick, into a monster and the most fucked up thing 
Remember how I'd mentioned United States of Terra, the show that focused on disassociative identity disorder and tackling some of the harmful misconceptions about it? This film, My Bloody Valentine 3D, came out in theaters literally two days before United States of Terror premiered. So right before this groundbreaking show comes, we got this movie. I have no other words about that other than it's fucked. It's so fucked. I hate it. Filmmakers, remake makers, stop doing this. Stop turning people who are sick into the bad guy. Stop taking a story and deciding the way it gives a gotcha is by flipping things around and portraying the mentally ill as ticking time bombs of death. The role this remake is playing is just that. It's playing the role of further stereotyping the mentally ill. And that's a problem. That's all I have for you today, scholars. Tune in for next week's lecture where we will be discussing Little Shop of Horrors, the 1986 musical version. Until then, stay scary. <laughs>